Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sarah and team earlier this morning. And what a, uh, I know I've mentioned this before, but sometimes uh, the songs just bring me to tears and uh, I have to get myself cleaned up before I get back up here uh, at the day. But those, those songs just resonate uh, this week. I, I appreciate many of you uh, were aware that uh, I had an opportunity this week uh, to be a part of a, a large a funeral that was done here in Xenia. And uh, I appreciate your prayers on my behalf. I, I thank the Lord for the opportunity that he gave uh, to share the gospel with probably about 300 people uh, in terms of, of the funeral. And uh, praying for the, the fruits and the seed of the gospel to bear fruit in the lives of people. Uh, and so this has been a week for some that's been a week of real sadness and real difficulty, uh, as Steve mentioned. And for others, it's been one of the great weeks that you've enjoyed. And God calls us here to look up to him and give him thanks uh, for the good things that we enjoy and to give him thanks and to trust in him in the midst of the darkness that he's not absent, that in his providence and goodness he's working good things. If we lean in on him, we'll find the way through and maybe even find the way to honor him and draw people to him in the midst of our own suffering and grief. So, so good to see all of you here this morning. I hope you're prepared to listen and by that I would encourage you to have your Bibles at hand. I would encourage you, if you have something to write down notes, that you would do that, and you'll find in the bulletin a space for you to do that, right? Or some of you in your Bible, which is like the filing cabinet, you can pull something out in there and write on it uh, if you have that. And we have been in a series over this year on the doctrines of the church. Doctrines just means teachings of the church. Uh, and, and here we're trying to lay out the major uh, teachings the, uh, from the Scripture. The reason why they're the doctrines and the teaching of the church is because they come from God's Word that He's revealed to us about who He is, about what He's up to, about who we are and how we get related to Him. So that's what He's revealed in His Scripture, and so we've tried to synthesize those in the church so that we can understand who God is, and then we can understand what He's up to, we can understand who we are, and we can relate to Him properly. So all those things is what we're doing. And so we've been in a year-long series, and most recently, as you can see up on the screen, we've been talking about the nature of the church, right? So ecclesiology, right, to repeat that, ecclesiology is the mashup of two Greek words. Ecclesia means assembly or church, and lagos means a word or an account of the church. And so ecclesiology is just what the scriptures teach about the nature of the church. And so we've talked about what the church is, right? The people of God that have come to believe on Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ, the one who came, who died, and he died on the cross. Not, he wasn't taken there. He went up on the cross because he was accomplishing salvation. And what he was doing on that cross is he was going on to the cross to take the punishment that we as rebels against the creator God deserve for ourselves. And so he took that punishment into himself, right? And then he resurrected from the grave. He was buried and resurrected from the grave to declare his kingship, his power over sin and death. And so when we, Jesus did that for us to make a way back for us underneath God's rule that we had spurned. So he's the king and he came to declare that he's the king, the one that can deal with the threat of death and everything that is against us. And COVID reminds us of that. So Jesus came and conquered death. He came away, he made a way for us to be righted with the creator that we had rebelled against. And so we as the people of God have heard, uh, uh, we've identified him as the king by God's grace. We've believed on him as the king. And uh, we're serving him by coming under his rule. And we get blessed by being under his rule. And so as his people, we're going around saying the king has come. The king has provided a way into the kingdom Please, please turn from your rebel rebellion. Believe in Jesus Christ. Come under his benevolent rule because the king is coming. And when the king comes, there's going to be judgment. So we're the people of God that live in between the coming of Christ and the return of Christ. Or as Peter might call it, we're the people who live in the time of God's patience, right? And as Steve was talking about, even in our darkest moments, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you, you have reason to give praise and give thanksgiving because all the things that really threaten you have been removed. And all the things that you face today, as dark and as difficult they can be, be a pale in comparison with having God set against you as your enemy. And when he has made you his friend, right, if he is for you, nothing truly can be against you. Nothing can take from you everything that really matters. 
I don't care what the disease is. I don't care what the reversal is. I don't care what the abandonment may be from someone. I don't know what the struggle with sin it is that you have. But God rescues people deeply. He holds them to himself tenaciously. And he will complete in them what he's begun. Amen? I mean, today we've got something to give thanks to God for. I don't care how dark it is today. I don't care what the regrets are you have from the past. And many of us carry those regrets. And they come back and haunt us with that. Jesus says, I've covered those. They're gone. Right? You're mine. I don't care if he rejects you or she rejects you. You're mine. And I will never reject you. Right? So praise God. He's good. He's good today. Right? Praise God for that. He's good today. So we're those people who have experienced the goodness of God by His grace. His undeserved favor has been lavished on us. Lavished on us to take rebels and make us sons and daughters. Right? That's who the church is. Right? Now, when you think about the makeup of the church, here we've come to our topic to talk about what the makeup of our church is. And here we've talked about members and leaders. So I need to turn on my thing here. I'm getting carried away here about what's going on. Um, we're talking about members and leaders. And so I need to advance me forward here, Drew. I'm, I'm, I can't get it forward. So we've been talking about the church, how it's organized, right? The, the term, if you're looking in theology texts, the really theology texts, the discussion of the church down through the ages, right? They, they put it under the idea of polity or the, how you organize the church. And so just to read this, the description of what the Bible teaches about how the church should organize itself and govern its affairs, right? It's a distinct group of people with Christ as its head. That's interesting here. Christ is the head. He's the head of the church. He's the one who tells us who we are and gives us our marching orders. Matter of fact, he's the one that we're trying to imitate and promote by our very life, individually and corporately. He's the head of the church, and he's the one that tells us who we are. He's the one that allows us to be a part of this group of people, and he's the one who gives us direction about what we are and how we're to be, right? So we trust him, and we turn to the Scriptures to give us guidance because it's the words of the Lord telling us who we are and what we should be up to. Well, we find out here that the governance affairs, including the nature and roles of the members, and that's what we talked about before, and as Dan became a member here, we talked about membership, is that Dan is coming, and and a covenant was just made between Dan and I, and between Dan and you that are members here at Emmanuel. Dan entered into this agreement voluntarily that he's committing himself to this body, and he recognizes his responsibilities to love us. And to love us, that may be varied things. To love us is to use his gifts as God has given him to invest in this body. To love us may be as a friend somewhere down the road that if he sees one of us walking away from Jesus, he comes to us and says, hey, Greg, I love you. You can't be walking this way. I want to pull you back, right? Dan's going to invest his gifts and and resources here and pray for this group of people because now his, his life is connected to us, right? And so by coming in, we've affirmed him as a follower of Jesus, and now we've committed ourselves to his discipleship. So Dan just doesn't come in and get hot towels and chocolates and right, all kinds of benefits here. You don't get any of those in Emmanuel, right? Maybe we could think about that one time. But Daniel doesn't come in here and get those things. He comes in, he commits himself to us. We commit ourselves to him. So now Dan is on my prayer list. Dan is someone that I need to invest in. Dan is my brother in Christ, okay? Now, I, I consider this a particular... Uh, good thing that Dan's here today. I've had Dan for two classes at Cedarville, and we're still friends, right? That's a good thing, right? I have him currently as a student, and he's being uh, kind of grilled by me three times a week, so we're still there. So I'm so glad that he's here, and I'm looking forward to what God's going to use Dan to do among us, right? So he's coming here. He's not a consumer. Dan is not coming here and shopping in some religious provider, because he likes what it has to offer. No, Dan is a brother who's coming here as a producer to invest, and we're investing in him. And we're committed. So I have obligations, and he to me, for our mutual flourishing and growth. Right? So members, we've talked about that. And then today, our topic is to continue part two on leaders. Who are the leaders in the church? And then our next one, we're going to talk about the relationship of our church to other bodies of believers in the city and around the world. I want to talk about that. So let's talk a little bit about leaders, right? I already talked through that. Uh, And we talked about here, we believe that every believer has been gifted and called to enable the body to grow up into Christ. There are no spectators in the body of Christ, only spirit-empowered ministers of God's grace in Christ. Now, I think, Drew, 
I'm going to give, give you a pause to see. I think what is loaded up here is last week's PowerPoint. That is last week's PowerPoint. That's why I'm, I'm filling in on slides that I didn't think were there. Right? So <clears throat> if, if you can find that other one, I don't know if you can help him with that one. It would help me because this one is uh, a little bit different. But I will move on from there. All right, just so you know, try to, try to get there. So if you can, let's see here. Let me move here. Our topic today is what do the leaders do? That's what we're up to. And we found, and the, the, the slide here, I just want to read to you our value uh, here about who the elders and deacons are. What we found in terms of those first three questions, we found out, well, who are the leaders? How do they become the leaders? Right, it's talking about them. Well, what we found is that the scriptures teach that there are two offices, if you will. There are elders and there are deacons, right? Elders are also referred to as pastors, the same office, just a different title. And they're also referred to as overseers. So they, they're synonyms, if you will. They all refer to the same office or the same person. They just refer to them from different perspectives in terms of the kinds of things that they do. Okay? That is the PowerPoint. I love that. Thank you very much. All right? So we talked about here, right, that elders and deacons, we believe that God desires that the body of Christ be led by elders and served by deacons under the leadership of those elders. We also believe that our structuring of those offices must allow the church to maximize the potential of its leadership to grow, protect, enable, and mobilize this body for the glory of God, right? Now, those are our values as a church that are structured by what we believe the Scripture teaches. So we believe the Scripture teaches that there should be elders and that there should be deacons, but what the Scripture doesn't tell us is how the elders organize themselves among themselves or how the deacons organize themselves among themselves. So there's a lot of tradition that our churches have developed over time, which is really an attempt to be wise about how to run a church, but uh, we argued here just quickly that that seems to be a multiplicity of pastors, not a single pastor, and that's unusual in many traditions. But everywhere you meet elders in the New Testament, it's plural. There seems to be more than one pastor. And we've organized ourselves as pastors here to work together toward our common mission as leaders of the church. Our deacons have organized themselves in such a way that we've broken them up into different committees that are responsible for different facets of their service ministry. And I'll illustrate that a little bit later down the way. But that's a part of wisdom. And that's not a part of thus saith the Lord. It doesn't say in Scripture, right, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that thou shalt elect a chairman of the deacon board. There is no such position, right, in the New Testament. But that's a wisdom issue that we have developed in the process of that. And that's why it's not a hard and fast thing, and it may change over time. Now, here I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And even though I have it up here on the screen, I want you to turn there in your own Bibles. Uh, and I don't know what your philosophy is about Bibles here in terms of how you treat them. Uh, I know that when I was growing up, I had uh, people, because of Bibles were rare and maybe expensive, that they frowned very much on you writing in your Bible. Well, that's not my particular philosophy. I, I want to use my Bible, uh, and I want to engage it, and so often for me to use it well, I need to mark it up. Now, for some of you, that's just like, no, I can't do that, I can't read it. But I, I would encourage you to do that. I would rather have you wear out a Bible over a period of time than to have a pristine Bible when you die, right? Wear out one, right? Mark it up. Learn from it, right? Then after a while, if you've marked it up too much, you may have to get rid of it and start over again because you'll start reading your notes instead of the Bible, right? So, but whatever you do, engage it. And so this morning, right, as I have the text up here, one of the ways that helps you remember it is when you mark a key thing or you check something, Right? You put something down and let that just become a little goad that kind of sticks into your soul. All right? So here we're talking about what do pastors do. Okay, what are they up to? And again, I could say what do elders do would be the same thing, or what do overseers do? That's a, all the same office, uh, just referring to it here in the term that we prefer, which ironically is much more traditional in the West because the idea of people being pastors, shepherds is really the Greek word, shepherds, is not the predominant way that church leaders are talked about. It's predominantly they're either elders or overseers in terms of that. Overseers, they give spiritual oversight to the church. Elders, they should have a deep knowledge of God that's been honed by life experience, so it had a connotation of age. And then a pastor, right, someone who cares for, watches, and guides. 
in terms of that. So let's read this passage together. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Now here, the unusual part about that title, I just want to mention this here, is you have a list of distinct apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then an unusual thing here where Paul goes, pastors, teachers. Sometimes it's even hyphenated, pastor, teacher. Because those two words are not separated from each other the way apostles, prophets, and evangelists are separated. And so almost all interpreters believe that pastor, teacher is a description of one particular kind of person, right? And it's describing the pastor from the perspective of his main job is to teach the Word of God. And we're going to talk about to teach it not only in word, but to teach it in terms of life. So he's to proclaim the nature of God's truth in his words and in his living. Right? So we'll talk about that. So the one person. Now here, verse 12. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay. Now what I want to do here is I want to pull this passage apart uh, and talk about what pastors do, and also I want you to pay attention to what pastors don't do. Okay? That's equally important as opposed to what they do. Now let me talk about a couple things. Okay, now if you have your passage, I want to look at two different uh, parts here. I want to begin at verse 12. It says here, um, I'll find my own verse here, uh, to equip his people for works of service. Okay? Now, if you see here on the side here, the, the pastor teachers, now this is the first thing, I've got to say this, right? I am a pastor, it's always awkward to talk about yourself right, in terms of these, but here, just hear me, apart from me, just hear me saying what God is saying here. He says that certain types of people are God's grace gifts to his people, right? Now, I know that many of us have had times when we've had a hard time viewing our pastor as a grace gift, right? Really? Are you kidding me? I could do without that gift in terms of that. But Christ said, I have acted, and and what it's talking about is that in his triumphant work on the cross, when Jesus accomplished his purposes, he gave his spirit, and in conjunction with his spirit, he gave gifted people for the sake of his people in order to grow in him and know the life that he wants to give them, as well as to keep them on mission for him. So they've been gifted by him, and so the first thing that, that sits here right away is that pastors are gifts to be received in accordance with the nature of the gift, right? So there's a sense in which, you know, one of the obligations of a member here is that, one, you're going to be the one who's going to be affirming and appointing elders as they come along, but once that elder or pastor is in their position, we have agreed as a group of people to submit ourselves to the leadership of this church. And so insofar as the leadership of this church leads us toward Jesus and represents Jesus and is faithful to Jesus, we're called to follow willingly, not because we're being pressed to, because the pastors are never to lead out of coercion or manipulation. They're to share the cause of Christ, lead in the cause of Christ, and beckon those to follow. But we should be leading that way. And we should expect us to work together in terms of that. Well, as the grace gifts of God to his church, we should be people promoting the cause of Jesus, turning our eyes toward him on the mission of Jesus. That's what our job is to do because Jesus has given us to the body for that reason. Okay, key thing. Now, verse 12 then gives us the purpose then to equip, right? To equip, right, the believers, his people for works of service. Right? So here, there's a dynamic to the Christian life. Don't miss this here. Right? When you came to Christ and you come into Emmanuel, shame on us if you aren't being prodded to work and to serve. 
right? It's a dynamic life. It's not a, a coming, absorbing life, right? It's not come be a sponge, right? And then we're going to keep pouring things on you, right? No, it's come in here and engage. And so you're coming to listen, to learn, to do, right? So this is why all throughout Scripture, when you think about encountering the Word of God, whether you're reading in James or anywhere else, somebody who really listens to the Word of God is someone who listens to do it, not listens just to enjoy it, or listens to be reminded of certain things, or listens in order to discriminate things that they don't like when they hear. No, they listen to stand under it and obey, right? To trust the Lord of the Scripture and then follow Him out into life. And so we're to equip people to do works of service, right? And service here. So here I want you to notice, though, not to do the service for them. There's something dysfunctional in a pastorate who relieves you of opportunities to serve in the body of Christ. Now, I know that there's an identity sometimes that people think, well, what is a pastor? A pastor, right, is the spiritual SWAT team for the church, right? So you get into some difficulty, and you, your next-door neighbor needs to hear about Jesus. Okay, 911, Greg, uh, my neighbor needs to hear about Jesus. Can you come and share Christ with him? And I'm saying, well, okay, great. I'm glad your neighbor, I, it seems to me like Jesus has brought that person to your attention and put them right next door to you. It sounds to me like you should be sharing Jesus with them, right? And, but if the person turns back to me and go, well, what kind of pastor are you? And I'm going to say, a pastor who loves you. I'm a pastor who loves you, right? So a mature believer is someone who steps into their responsibilities. Shame on me if I'm encouraging you to be a baby Christian all the time. Right? So you need to step up to your colleagues. You need to step up to your neighbors. You got to step. Nobody in here is parent, right? I know, I, and I'm not saying we all don't need to help each other. And I'm not saying that the pastors would come and I would be along with you, right? I'm saying this, but the idea is I'm not the one who's supposed to do all the spiritual things and the job of the congregation is to make me aware of them, right? There's no gift of, you know, I'm the awareness person, right? I have the gift of awareness so that I can get other people to do things. No, that's not the gift here. The gift is I'm going to take what God's doing in my life and I'm going to plow into the areas where God's bringing people to me, right? So some of you, I can't reach your relatives. You can. I can't reach the people at your work. You can. I can't reach your neighbors. You can, right? And God's placed you right there with your own uniqueness, with your own background, with your own struggles, and he said, that's where you're at, right? My job is to equip you to be able to do that. And I want to suggest to you here, though, but to enable them to know Christ and so be transformed so that his passions and priorities become theirs. Now here, what I want to suggest to you here about equipping you, this is not primarily in Paul about me giving you a bunch of tools, okay? Now it could involve that, but let's say I want to equip you, so the very first thing I do is I order gospel tracts for everybody in the church and make sure everybody has five of them on their uh, you know, uh, table, right, or in your junk drawer where everything else is, right, so that you can go get them. Well, that's a, that's a kind of equipping, but Paul means something much more fundamental, much more substantive, right? The reason why you will serve Christ when it's not popular, the reason why a young person in this room will stand up and say, I identify with Jesus when they're in their classroom and everybody else thinks it's stupid or has no concern about that, it's because they love Jesus, not because their pastor gave them a track. My job is to grow your relationship with Jesus, to display that, to push you there, right? The only thing that's going to take us past our fear, the only thing that's going to motivate us to do things that other people think are crazy is that if we believe in Jesus and love him and we trust him, right? And so if you look back, and let me prove this to you, come back, there's two prayers that Paul has earlier in this thing where the burden of what he wants the Ephesians to get to know is they need to know the God that they've, that they've been related to in Jesus Christ. Come back to chapter 1 in his first prayer, right? So desperately, what our congregation needs, right, the work that God wants to do at Emmanuel is supernatural work. It's supernatural. When somebody puts their arms down and stops being a rebel, uh, uh, as Dan was talking about, they recognize their pride has set them off on a course by themselves, and they thought that they can make it all right with God, or they're listening to whoever they think knows. And when God confronts them by his grace and says, you're running away from me, I made you for myself, you're never going to find life apart from me, and they believe that message and they bow the knee to that, the only way that's going to happen is not because you're so persuasive. It's not going to happen just because you do all the right things. 
It's not going to happen because you just put the right literature in the hands. You're going to be a means that God's going to use, but the only way a person is going to bow their knee to Jesus is if there's a supernatural thing that happens. It's a supernatural thing that happens, right? And we get caught up in all the things that we can do, but it's got to be something that God does, and we're serving Jesus not because the people are going to like us in return, not because we find reward immediately from people for it, but we're compelled by Jesus to move forward toward them. And if they don't, we're brokenhearted because they're missing out on life. Right? That's a different sort of mentality. Right? So look what he prays for here in chapter 1. Verse 16, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may... Know him better. Right? Come over to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 16. Right? So here's Paul's burden. I, I, I'm supposed to equip you as a pastor, Steve, Pastor Steve, Pastor Van, Pastor Will. We have to be lovers of Jesus. We must be. You know what? I, I think about, I shared this with you in different ways as a pastor. After I've done this for a while, I was thinking the other day, this is maybe year 23 or 24 to Manuel. You know, I've been in different places and done lots of things. I know what to do at funerals. I know what to do at weddings. I kind of know what to do up front. I know those things. There's a difference between me being a professional and me being a lover of Jesus. There's two different things. And I get scared of being a professional. I get scared of it where I don't pay attention to my relationship with Jesus, to what's going on in my heart. Sometimes this morning, even singing today, God's mercy to me is to remind me as I'm singing, Lord, no turning back, no turning back. And he convicts me, Greg, you turned back this week. You turned back this week. And I just confessed to him, Lord, I turned back from your vision for me as a man. Forgive me, God. So it's not the big things. Nobody looked at my life and said, well, Greg, he's just turned completely around. But I know my heart. You know your heart. And in a moment where you got in a dark moment, instead of turning to him, you turned back to something else you shouldn't have turned to. And I just had to say, God, I turned back. Lord, I, I want that to be true of me every day, all the time. Right? So the issue here, we'll look in chapter 3. He goes after it again. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. Verse 16. Strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power, right? It, it, this is the interesting thing, to, to know the love of God in Christ, that you as a rebel have been not just saved, but he has set his affection on you and he's going to bring everything to fruition that you deeply were created for and you long for. And he's promised and he's given you your Holy Spirit as his down payment that he's going to accomplish everything that he's going to do. He's rescued you so deeply you don't even understand it. He loves you so tenaciously it's hard for you to get a hold of it. And that's what you need to plunge into that moves you out with power into the world to say, I'm going to serve him. I'm going to obey him. I'm going to say no to that sin. I'm going to represent Jesus to this person that's scary over here. I'm going to hold on to this truth. I'm going to hang on to my marriage. I'm going to trust him to let him have my finances. Right? I'm going to keep going after him in the face of this habit that's so dark in my life. Because he loves me and his love is tenacious and powerful. Right? The motivation that we serve Christ is not out of fear, it's out of the love that we have in him. And the more he, we understand his love for us, the more it is that we want to be someone who requites that love, who returns that love, right? So that kind of idea. So that's, that's the job of a pastor. And then two, the goal of the gifts then is in knowing Christ, as we know Christ together, that will drive and enable them to love their brothers and sisters and their unsaved neighbors as Christ toward Christ. All right, read this with me. Chapter 4 in Ephesians. He says here, uh, I keep losing my place, um, to equip people for works of service, then the latter half, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Right? Now, to put that in this language, till the point is, is that Christ's passions, what he's passionate about, his priorities, right, shape our individual lives and our corporate life together. It should be that you, you can't explain the life uh, of Sam 
You can't explain the life of Sam Huber. You can't explain the life of Stephen Gaines. You can't explain the life of Dorcas Hilliard if you can't put Jesus into that explanation. I don't know how to explain them other than say something happened to them. They talk about Jesus. Their life is different. The way they live is connected to that. The only way I can explain that is got to put Jesus in that picture because they love what he loves. Matter of fact, they don't love the same things. They don't fear the same things that other people fear. Right? At the end of the day, they're more concerned about how God views their life than they are concerned about how I, how I view it. Right? So the issue here is our life together is, is just all of a sudden we want what Christ wants because we believe, because he loves us, that to follow in the path of Christ is to follow the path of his loving care. Why do we trust him to restrain our sexual desires as husbands and wives and keep them to our husbands and our wives? Why? Because we trust Jesus. Why do we wait before we get married? Because we trust Jesus. Right? That's why. That's why we trust him. Now, there's all kinds of other reasons that we can make out that we know that's good for that. Right? There's other things that we could add to that, but the bottom line is the reason why I put myself in these boundaries. I wrestle before God, and I have people around me to help me to get there. Why? Because I believe Jesus, and he's laid out a path of love, not a path of constraint, a path of flourishing. So that's why I want to hang there, right, for that. So that's what we're after. Now let's move on a little bit further here. Then the idea here, whoops, this should have two clicks. It doesn't. I wanted you to see my crybaby thing up there. Uh, but I've just already X'd him out, right? But here in verse 14 then, then, right, when we love Christ, when we're guided by his priorities, right, Augustine, a famous theologian, right, is what God wants to do in you is he wants to do something deep, profound. That's why we're not interested here in behavioral modification, right? So if you struggle with anger, we're not going to give you five tips on, you know, how to deal with your anger from the outside in, Right? Like, whenever you feel angry, you know, count to ten backwards, right? Or whenever you feel angry, go get a pillow, put your face in it, and scream three times, right? Or go build yourself a false wall in your garage so you can go punch it. Just don't punch the one in your house, right? Whatever. We're not going to give you that kind of advice. What Jesus wants to do is he wants to go down and figure out, why are you such an angry man? Why are you such an angry man? Why does that dominate you? Why is it that you respond to every ver- reversal in your life with anger or for, with passive-aggressive behavior, right, or sarcasm? What's going on deep in your soul, right? And so what Jesus is after, he's after changing our love so that we come to love the right things in the right order to the right degree. And that means we put Christ first and we come to love him not because it's duty, not because I'm a church person, that that's just what I'm supposed to say, right? I say this to my Cedarville students all the time. If they're going to have some position of influence at the school, they're going to be in the SGA, they're going to be on some council in some org, you're not going to get that position unless you put a little Jesus on your interview. You've got to be a little Jesus on there, right? Because you've got to get after it. But the, the point should be is that's not what you should do to get the interview. That should just be a display of who you are. If you get the position, well, so be it. But who you are is a follower of Jesus. You don't put that on to get somewhere. That's just who you are. That's true for us. That's true for us as the people of God. Right? We don't come here and talk to each other on Sunday and say the things we should, are supposed to say. We need to come and say the things that we are. Right? God, forgive us for that. God, help us, right? to live out of that facade. Well, here he says, then you'll be no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming, right? When when, when you're you're rooted in Jesus, right? That terminology from chapter three, when you're rooted, right? uh, Lies, falsehoods, when they come at you, you're rooted, you don't move. You're right here. When other people say, no, life isn't found following Jesus, life is found over here sexually. Our life is found over here in terms of people's applause and likes and going viral. That's where life is really found. You're standing right here and you're going, no, there's no life over here. No, that's destruction over there. I'm, I'm rooted right here. So I don't get blown back and forth. And if you're at school and you're at high school and you find out that stand for Jesus, all of a sudden you were with a group and now the group's over there and you're right here. You may be weeping. You may be stinging from their rejection, but you're saying, Lord, I want to hold on to you because there's no life over there. There's no life over there. God, I'll take you, right? I'll take you. There's no turning back. 
put a cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. Right? Because there's life here. There's death out there. Lord, guard my heart from being afraid of loneliness. Lord, may I know that when I'm with you, I'm never alone. Take me deeply into that truth, Lord, right now, because I need to put up with loneliness on the outside. Lord, save me from being holier than thou. Lord, save me from a hardened heart that doesn't care about these people who are rejecting me. God, help me. Right? But I'm going to hold on to you. I'm not an infant. I'm not going to whine and cry about the things that have happened in my life. Lord, I trust you that you're good and you're good. As a matter of fact, that you've secured everything that really matters today. That person's view of me can't ruin me. His rejection of me can't ruin me. So that's the kind of thing that he wants us to be solid. Then he moves on. All right? When the gifts have been given and received, instead of speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Right? So now here, instead of being infants right, who are uh, unaware of God's goodness and who are unimpressed by his power and his grace, right? instead, overwhelmed by his love, confident in his ability... Right? There's a maturity about the person. And so what are we doing in this body? Right? What do we do as a group of believers? Right? Well, then it, it happens then is what I want to do is I want to bring God's truth to bear on your life. Because that's a path of life. That's a path of freedom. That's the path of protection. That's the path of wisdom. And so, but I do that in at least two ways. And this is why in the translation of this, the, the word itself, speaking the truth, is really trying to render a word that's really hard to to explain, it just says truthing it, right? Being truthful. And so it encompasses not just what you say, but it encompasses your life, right? And I tell you, for for married couples in here, right, if you're a married couple, there's a lot of truth that you're demonstrating by the way you talk to each other, the way you talk about each other, the way you relate to each other, the way you honor each other. There's a lot of people in here that have never known a relationship between a man and a woman that looks like that. They don't even know what it looks like. Matter of fact, they're even afraid of it because the kinds that they've seen have been broken and, and been uh, a, a shattered, uh, tattered vision of what God intended a man and woman to be in marriage. And so you're not teaching any seminar on marriage. You're not speaking any words. It's just the way you're relating to one another, somebody, giving somebody hope and a picture That's what it could be. That's what it looks like when a man actually protects and loves a woman and honors her. That's what it looks like. That's what a man looks like, right? So those are the kind of things that every day we're rubbing shoulders off of each other and we need to be truthing it to each other. A part of truthing it, right, a part of truthing it is that there's nobody who's arrived in here. And so there's a, there's a degree of transparency that's called for. Dan gave us a little bit this morning. I gave you a little bit on my own. I'm not doing that just because I should do it, but it's true of me. I'm a broken man. I'm on the way. I, I, de- I believe Jesus when he said, you're my disciple, Greg. You're my follower. You should be praying every day, Lord, deliver me from the evil one. Lord, d- deliver me from temptation. Why? Because I'm vulnerable today. I'm vulnerable. You're vulnerable today. You're vulnerable to hate, to lust, to greed, to a disengagement from God as if there isn't a mission, there isn't a God to serve, and so I can just whittle my life away. We're all prone to those things. We're prone to to, to callousness toward our neighbor, to dismissing our wives and our husbands, to, to abrogating our responsibility with our kids, to being more fearful of being disliked from our kids than being faithful to Jesus toward them. We're all liable. And we got our own struggles today. I need Jesus today. I need him. Right? So we are, every one of us, if, if you're in here and you've got it all together, we know you're lying. We just know it's not true. Because you don't have it all together. And if we know you long enough, we'll figure it out. Right? And that's not because we're trying to poke at each other, but because we're being real about who we are. If you, don't, if you come in here and think you don't need help, we know you're in a very bad place. Right? If you think you don't need help, you're in a very bad place. You're naive or you're full of pride. Okay? So when you come in here, this is, people, we need to love each other. We shouldn't be surprised at the sin that we find among us. 
We should just be surprised that God loves us despite it. Right? We should just be surprised. Okay, I accept, if God can accept you, I think I can accept you. Right? If God can accept you, I can do it. God, help me to have your heart. Right? If they're, not, if they're failing in an area where I'm not failing, God, forgive me for thinking that I'm better for them because, Lord, if my life was spilled out, you'd know it. Forgive me, Lord, for being a judge with evil motives. Right? So we want to grow up. And so then what? That's the goal, the picture. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does his work. An interdependent group of people who love each other to Christ as Christ. Right? So when you walk in, the mission, right? The mission is to love each other. Right? Husbands, when you get, you get a mission when you get home from your work. Right? I faced this one, especially when my kids were younger. You can't lay out all of your energy at work and then come home and be the limp rag dad when you get home. Limp rag husband when you get home. Right? You got to come home with energy because your mission is right there in front of you. When we walk in this door, this is, this is a place where the evil one is at work trying to undermine the health and effectiveness of this church. He's after our unity. He's after our heart for Jesus. He's after all those things. When you walk in, you're on mission today. You got people who are under attack and on, uh, on thread. They've had a terrible week behind them. Well, where are you at? We're, well, we're on, we're on mission today. Right? We're busy. Right? I'm praying, number one, for me to hear what God wants me to get to listen, and I, I got my antenna up for what's going on in my brothers and sisters around me because I need to join in with them in prayer. Maybe he's going to prompt me to do something afterwards. Maybe I need to write them a note. Maybe I just need to be with them and weep with them. I don't know. But there's plenty of things that are going on. I'm not a spectator. Everybody's on the game, the field of play. Everybody's there, right? Now, we may have different places, roles to play, but everybody's there. Now, I've shot my time, so I'm not going to say anything more about what I've said this morning. But the goal here, then, is pastors, teachers. Our job is to love Jesus primarily and to let him shape our lives and to commend that Jesus to you by life and word and to teach you and to display the glories of Christ and what he's done before you so that you get an adequate vision of Christ, so that you get related to him in a way that will make you someone who wants to be like him and wants to do what he asks, because you trust him and you love him. And as we do that, we get shaped into his image, and we come together, and what I want, I know you've heard me say this before, I've got a basic mission in my life. A person who doesn't know Jesus, what's my job? To love them to Jesus. A person who knows Jesus, to love them deeper. That's my job. Now, it takes many different faces, but that's my job. So I, 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 w- I would ask you to pray for us as pastors that God would help us our walk with Jesus to be rich and real and genuine. And God to save us from trusting in our own abilities or disengaging in ways that we don't need to. So I pray for us. And I, and I pray for us as a body that as we walk in together, Lord, that we trust. I pray this. And I do, this is my last conclusion of my three conclusions. My last one, okay? Uh, I I was praying, thank you, my brother. I'm getting somebody super encouraging over here, thank you. Um, I I was praying today as I was driving in with Rana. And it just hit me today. I was thinking, Lord, thank you that I have a church to go to. One, because... It means behind that that you rescued me as a rebel and made me your own. And I belong to you. And now you've given me a people to belong to. God, forgive me for the way that I've elevated the difficulties of a broken people being together and I've failed to celebrate the fact that I belong to you, that I belong to your people, and the Lord, that we have a privilege to come together and encourage one another to love you. That's what the church is about, right? We get all caught up with all the craziness that the evil one wants to have us there. 
But I, I pray that we'll become a group of people that give thanks to God for his rescue of us. We give thanks to God for the people of God. And the reason why we're here together and we're thrown in with each other and we're putting up with each other's craziness and brokenness is because we trust the Lord of the church that that's how he's designed it for us to grow and to flourish and be effective. That's it. That's it. That's it. Right? Pray with me, will you? And team, will you come up and sing for us? Lord, we're just so grateful for your kindnesses to us today, Lord, and we don't even know how to get inside that phrase, Lord, because you have been so good to us as uh, our musicians so helped us to see today. You've been so good. Lord, I pray for the person who's in the darkest place today, Lord, that they would see the bright light of the cross, Lord, the definition of the lengths and the depths and the heights and widths of your love. Lord, right there it is displayed in, in the King of all kings, the one who knew no sin, who became sin for them. Lord, that they might be freed from what was rightfully theirs and then they might be able to enter into the life that he won. Lord, they've been given everything. Lord, as Paul celebrates that, uh, Lord, we begin heaven and hell, life and death, things present, things to come, all are ours because we are Christ's and he is yours. Lord, take us into the joy of that. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for us as leaders and as uh, members. Lord, please knit us together. Lord, help us to love each other generously and well. Lord, give us strength and wisdom. Lord, forgive us for the, 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 the weakness of our love, the, the tepid way in which we're committed to your purposes. Lord, help us to move past our preferences, our irritations. Lord, draw us to each other, we pray. Pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>